uh, biggest value is that it just opens up new avenues of what you can accomplish in a reasonable amount of uh, computer time. You don't have to have major uh, clusters or you know cloud computing or any of that for uh, some problems that were just uh, computationally infeasible on standard CPUs. You really see uh, an order of magnitude or two orders of magnitude speed up uh, by going to OpenCL or CUDA, and that uh, opens up a lot of possibilities. And so in finance, there's no real difference between OpenCL and CUDA. You're seeing kind of the same challenges, and if so, what are the challenges? Yeah, the challenges, I mean, generally, you just want to first address uh, what sort of, you know, if the problem you have can be uh, parallelized to a degree that makes it worthwhile to port it to OpenCL or CUDA, and secondly, to actually develop and optimize for uh, which, whichever one you target. The biggest advantage CUDA really has at the moment is that uh, it has, I think, a more mature library ecosystem that uh, OpenCL is kind of missing at the moment. Do you know personally a lot of financial firms are using one or the other right now? Um, uh, from what little I've heard, it's more CUDA than OpenCL, but I don't, I haven't, you know, talked to tons of people by any means. And so this is more a matter of maturity versus functionality when it comes to CUDA versus OpenCL? Yeah, absolutely. I think that, you know, in the long run, you know, OpenCL has uh, sort of gotten a late start and it's a bit behind, but when it catches up in terms of the libraries and uh, just, well, yeah, mostly in terms of libraries, it will probably be at, uh, at least as popular as CUDA, if not more so. So today you kind of demoed for us a little bit of the work you're doing in financial services with Mathematica. Yeah. Can you give us the really high-level overview of, of what you explained today? Uh, so basically we just showed that uh, with Mathematica we could generate, uh, given relatively little effort, uh, OpenCL kernels to compute for uh, analytically priceable options and Monte Carlo methods for more complicated path-dependent options. Uh, you can extend the same idea to basically other techniques, not only in finance, but in other fields as well. It essentially amounts to writing a very small domain-specific language that gets translated to uh, OpenCL. Right, so the biggest advantage of the APU is that it bundles the uh, GPU along um, with the CPU. And that means that, you know, a system like, you know, so that, first of all, means uh, much bigger, um, you know, much bigger user base have GPU capable devices, and that translates to Mathematica, you know, figuring out that you know GPU is available and in future versions be able to actually execute uh, code. You know, let, so let's say you know you're trying to do PDE solving, then maybe eventually we can detect that you know there's a GPU on the system and. Uh, and uh, you know, use that. So we're seeing you know this sort of you know uh, the line between CPU and GPU uh, being quite fuzzy, you know. And you know, we would like to make it fuzzier in Mathematica by eliminating completely. So users don't have to know if they have a GPU. Users don't have to know what CPU they're running, how many cores they're running. We want to make it uh, so users get speed ups. Uh, without knowing technical details, I mean, uh, you know, there's no reason to like you know uh, figure out you know what hardware you're running to actually get speed ups. And, and this is my last question, I promise. What what do hardware what do hardware vendors kind of forget about? What don't they think about you know when it comes to to software folks like yourself on the GPU front? Um. So that's quite. Uh, so I mean, there there's one thing. So you know, they they talk about gigaflops. Uh, so you know, 500 gigaflops, one teraflop, 2.5 teraflops. But you know, you'd only get those speed ups if you spend an unbelievable amount of time to squeeze every little bit of your um, you know of your of, of your program. So they talk about you know. Teraflops per watt, uh, you know, teraflops per dollar. But you know, what we're concerned with is teraflops per developer time. You know, developers are much. You know, developer time is much more expensive than watts, or you know, you, you, you can you can afford wasting you know 50 watts if 
you know, if you're saying that we're going to waste one develop year, year. So, you know, we, we're concerned with, you know, teraflop or gigaflop per developer hour rather than uh, watt or, you know, price. Because th those are secondary, I think. Dylan is furiously nodding over here. Dylan? <laughs> Yeah, I have to agree with that. I mean, I think it's uh, just like we saw with uh, single-core CPUs back in the late 90s. The race was to get the highest clock speed the fastest without regard to what it actually meant. In that case, it was sort of that you could not necessarily, no matter how much effort you put in, you might not get the performance that the clock speed indicated. Here, you can probably get that performance, but you know, it may be that you can only get it on trivial problems, or it may be that uh, you know, to get that sort of performance on real, actual, real-world applications, you need to put in an enormous amount of time. And, uh, you know, that's just something that needs to be taken into consideration, I think. And so, you know, so, and, you know, for every teraflop, you need an application that uses that teraflop. Uh, and, you know, it's very, very, uh, you know, you know, so there's a lot of applications that don't utilize, you know, uh, the GPU. So, you know, something like a browser won't utilize three teraflops to render a YouTube video. Uh, but scientific computation always has a need for more and more teraflops, more and more speed, because, you know, as, as the, you know, as the um, CPU and GPU uh, increases in power, you're also, you know, exponentially, you also have, you know, a much faster increase in data set size. So now, you know, you know, three years ago, a five gigabyte data set would be huge. Now, you know, five terabytes is common. Uh, so we need, uh, you know, in scientific computing especially, we need uh, faster teraflops, where in, in many other applications, you don't really need, uh, you know, you know, you don't really, really need that much power unless you're going to write uh, bad code. And, and data keeps getting bigger too, so this isn't right, like some, right. so, something that, that can ever be right. scaled once and then... And right, then so that. you know, data gets bigger, you have um, smaller space to put your computers, you have you know, very power, you know, power rules, so you, you always have the need for teraflops in finance or scientific computing, whereas you know, maybe you don't need uh, more than, you know, maybe 500 gigaflops is fine for um, video processing or uh, image processing or gaming, but in scientific computing, uh, you do need you know the fastest GPU or CPU, the fastest you know you know essentially scientific computing drives high performance computing. Uh, everything else just tags along you know five years later. Dylan, anything to add? Uh, not really. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, guys.